You're watching Duke's Copy TV. I'm Elaine Stenson and I'm joined in studio now by Jacques Shudin, who's partner with technology exporting firm Europtic. Jack, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Can you start by telling me a little bit about what Neuroptech does? Basically, let's put it this way, is why did we get together and create Neuroptech? Uh, I have been based in Asia and active in Asia, uh, developing markets for European companies for the past 38 years. And uh, I wanted to return to Switzerland and I wanted to share my knowledge uh, of developing the markets for other companies here in Europe and make it available especially for the small enterprises and the uh, startups here in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the idea and I partnered with a colleague, a friend of mine, who uh, is basically here, uh, has a home office and knows all about the laws and legislations and what you can do and what you cannot do here in Switzerland. And together we uh, built a network and developing new businesses and new opportunities for uh, companies with a focus on technology. So how do companies benefit from your firm? We've had a few mandates up to now where basically we have supported uh, heavy investment goods in uh, installations and so forth because it makes no sense of uh, supplying sometimes big equipment and not having the babysitting, I would say, the customer to the end, uh, that he can get the full benefits, benefits of the high technology which is built into our products, mm -hmm. European products. Sometimes you have like, uh, I would say, if you buy an expensive car like a Ferrari or something like that, you should spend a little bit of time test driving it before you go onto the main streets with it. Mm. And um, what are the main mistakes that European-based companies make when doing business with companies in Asia? Well, I don't like using the, the approach of mistakes because I'm not here to criticize people, I'm here to help them. <laughs> what are the main challenges that well, they I would face? Say basically, we should, a lot of companies uh, can do better yeah. in, in Asia, especially, like I said, is babysitting the customers that buy heavy equipment and uh, other customers understand the culture a little bit. And one of the key factors I noticed in uh, developing businesses in the past years in Asia is that I've fortunately looked old before being old. <laughs> I'm not like a woman who wants to look young until she's 65 or above. In my case, I looked old very young. And the customer base uh, in Asia th took me as a senior person. And today I feel that a lot of companies are sending out youngsters uh, that have full knowledge of the products, but are not getting the, the right correspondence because in Asia we have, they have a high respect for seniors, a higher respect for seniors than what we may have here in Europe. So okay. I would say that someone like me who has done 38 years of Asia is a person that gets along very well in getting the right contacts in reaching into customers. One other aspect that I've noticed in investment goods, uh, especially in machinery, uh, there's a lack of sometimes contact between the sales force and the technical service force. And if you want, the, tech, the sales force meets the managing director, meets the purchasing man, meets eventually the plant manager uh, when it comes to that. But on the other hand, the technical people are working on the floor, meet the operators, and they hear all the problems that they have. And sometimes by putting the two together, or helping mediate, listening both sides, we can offer the best solution for the customer. And what is the biggest growth area, as in what European experts are most in demand to the Asian market? Well, here you have to look at two sides. On the technology side uh, and the uh, equipment size side, Asia is becoming more and more concerned with European and American standards. And I'm talking here mainly on packaging, which is a field which I worked in quite a bit for the last 12 years. Uh, and the products being manufactured and packaged in Asia uh, now have to start to have to meet the European standards. And uh, for this, then there is a, gr a great deal of growth area uh, in this part. 
of the world uh, because to meet those standards they need different equipment, they need different approaches, different products and consumables. Mm -hmm. On the consumable side, uh, consumer side, I see a growth in the segment of uh, luxury items. We see with China, the Swiss watch industry is doing tremendously well. And there is a growth also for uh, niche items, uh, niche products, where the consumers are starting to, one, have a bigger uh, disposable income and are also getting very interested in being, uh, having a story between, with the product that they're buying. Uh, we take, for example, the French wines and so forth. They like the stories of the castle behind the Bordeaux or the Chateau Latour or whatever. Uh, and they, they like uh, entertaining people by offering such wines and telling the story okay. behind this thing. And a lot of products that we are exporting today, uh, be it from Switzerland, Germany or France, we like to put the sort of romance or the story behind the products. Okay. Okay? That's what I feel at least and I think when we come, I was one the other day I was in Indonesia and I saw a beautiful chocolate shop I would say basically up to the standards of what we find here in Geneva, but all the labels were just written chocolate and the price. And I thought that if they would have put a little bit of story saying that this is a, a, a chocolate coming from Venezuela or this is a chocolate coming from Ecuador or something like that, they would have much better chances in selling their products and, and motivating yeah. the customers to buy it. Hmm? And you lived in Asia for many years. Yes. How do you think, what did you see in terms of the change in the market there, in your time there? <laughs> The funniest one that I saw was the handover between Hong Kong uh, from England to China. And I say that the biggest change that I saw there were the bankomats, the ATM machines. Oh, yeah. Because be before 1997, uh, basically when you logged into an ATM machine, first came English and you had to choose Chinese. After 1997, now comes Chinese and you have to choose English. <laughs> That's about the biggest sort of change that I saw due to the handover and the development. What I saw great change is, uh, unfortunately due to SARS, uh, the Cleanup Act. Uh, Asia has become much more cleaner than it was before SARS. People have been conscious of uh, their environment and they have started to become more and more curious about other products, European. Uh, if I go back into the 80s, I met in one company in Thailand a, a technical person who gave me, gave me his business card and his title was Head of Japanology. And that attracted my attention and I said, what is that? And he said, well, basically, I'm here to import Japanese technology into this company. <laughs> so uh, that has changed. If I look back in the 70s, in seven, January 78, uh, South Korea could, until January 78, South Korea could only purchase from Japan. As of January 1, 1978, they got the authorization to purchase from other places of the world and the business developed greatly f from there. So there is a growing interest in not only looking into Asian products, but also looking into what Europe has to offer or what the US has to offer. Jack, thank you very much for that and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me over. Mm -hmm. And that's all we have time for for now, but do check back later for further updates and interviews from the Dukas Copy TV team. Bye for now.